Almost every aspect of human life has become drugified in some way or another. What do I mean by drugified? I mean made more reinforcing, releases more dopamine in our brain's reward pathway, made more ubiquitous, easier to access, meaning that 24-7 we can get cupcakes, cocaine, and pornography uh, whenever we want. So therefore, because our ancient wiring is mismatched for this modern ecosystem, we now have a new mandate, a new and unprecedented mandate, where we have to intentionally insulate ourselves from these reinforcing stimuli in order to be in balance with our ancient wiring, with our bodies, with this ecosystem. And if we don't do that, if we relentlessly pursue pleasure, as it seems we are doing now, especially in rich nations, we will end up in this dopamine deficit state, which is our neurological response uh, in the process of becoming addicted. Uh, and we will end up more depressed, more anxious, um, and overall less happy with our lives. Do the data really show that cases are increasing? It's complicated. And most, neuro most psychologists and psychiatrists will agree. And that is the additional numbers could be owed to a variety of things. And we know, for example, that during COVID cases rose and that was mostly due, most psychiatrists show, to extreme loneliness. And also when people lost their jobs, that produced um, concern, anxiety, worry, depression. The second part of the story is that it's become culturally acceptable to say that you're depressed. In fact, amongst high income Americans, it's become a cultural necessity, so I'm told, uh, to have a therapist, to go on Facebook and talk about your therapy and talk about your menti B, which I discovered means mental breakdown. The final thing is that when I looked at the data, from the most recent data from Johns Hopkins, which uh, was an excellent survey of 24,000 people, but also the data from the previous NIH survey of depression and, and both uh, most recent Gallup polls, it does not show that high income people are more depressed than low income people. Okay. All three of those show the reverse. Yeah, so gonna... when you talk about the, ple the pleasure paradox, maybe it ain't even there. What I think is compelling about uh, the happiness surveys, which they've evolved to over time, is that they are purely subjective. So they have you on a ladder or a scale from one to 10, just rate how happy you are. And then they do that repeatedly over years. And it's not based on individuals, uh, Patricia, it's based on nations. So if you're looking at data on whether like individual wealthy people feel better than individual you know, poor people, these data, the happiness surveys are based in aggregate on countries oh, yeah. and, and my claim being that a very interesting trend with happiness surveys was that prior to about 2000, as wealth increased in a given nation, happiness went up. But starting about 20 years ago, uh, in those same countries, uh, happiness started to go down. And so I really do think it does beg the question, even if, especially since it's purely subjective, what is happening there? What's the phenomenon? What are you saying? Why? Is has the uh, depression increased over the last 20 years? What is your point? I believe that one potential contributor to rising rates of depression, anxiety, suicide in some countries uh, is overabundance and is our escalating consumption of highly reinforcing substances and behaviors and the drugification of everything. And that's more life. in the last 20 years than the yes. 10 years before yes. that? And, and by the way, when I say that, I'm not saying that um, mental illness is not a contributor. I'm not saying that trauma is not a contributor. I'm not saying that social dislocation is not a contributor. What I'm asking people to uh, contemplate is whether or not it is our relentless pursuit of pleasure in all these different forms that is actually contributing to our misery. And I'm basing that on some inferences I'm making on the neuroscience, which do show that repeated consumption of highly reinforcing drugs and behaviors 
leads to a dopamine deficit state. And that's been well documented that the pathophysiology of addiction is that intoxicants release a lot of dopamine all at once, but over time with repeated exposure, you end up in a dopamine, chronic dopamine deficit state, which is our brain's attempt to compensate with this for this fire hose of too many reinforcers. And then you essentially change your hedonic set point. And this is true whether the, the drug is food and we're looking at obesity, the reason that obese people have so much trouble losing weight is because they've essentially changed their hedonic set point and they have a great deal of difficulty then changing that back, especially in an ecosystem where salt, fat, sugar, and flavorants have been added to even sliced bread and on and on from there with almost everything that we do. The difficulty still with these claims that cases of depression are going up amongst wealthy people, we don't know why. I mean, one of the things that I realize as a scientist is that if you're going to believe the data, it's kind of like buying a car, a used car. You really got to do the work and look at it and see whether or not you want to buy this thing. And when you look at the data, and Anna admits this, the data are based on subjective reports. And we don't know whether there have been cultural shifts that largely, or perhaps not at all, we just don't know whether there have been cultural shifts that allow people or even encourage people to say they're depressed. Certainly in my farming community, nobody was depressed. I mean, nobody ever would admit to be depressed. So, so before we get on this bandwagon about how people are this and people are that, and they're having too much fun and they really need their drugifying when they go and visit their grandparents or their grandchildren. You know, I have a lot of fun when I visit my grandchildren. Am I being drugified? Yeah, I better go drop something hard on my foot. In short, this is the dark side of capitalism. It's a great system for human achievement, for will to power, but there is a dark side and we are entering that dark side. And that dark side is uh, the problem of overabundance, overconsumption. Can I just say one quick thing? I, I, Correlation does not imply causality. So sure. yes, income has gone up. That does not imply that that's the cause of the anxiety yeah. and depression. Of it course. does not. Of course. But, yeah. but we, we can we make need causal, real data. We can make causal inferences. And the, the comment that you need, quote unquote, real data is just... Yeah. To me, that's kind of a cop out. It's like the, the kinds of data that we need to answer these very complex social psychological problems are probably not within the scientific method. So oh, we need to put our brains okay, together. Okay, I got it. This isn't a scientific question then. What the cause is? Well, you know, what matters is the cause at the end of the day. You're not 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 what the data tells you. I what think. caused it? And and if you I can't think. get to the cause Different through science, what can you? Scientific method for neuroscience as opposed to social science. It just all it, kinds of science. I don't care what the science is, but but Anna says it's not a scientific question. No, that's not what I said. But I, I think that, you know, the kinds of sort of looking at Excel spreadsheets and, you know, looking for the real facts and the numbers and this and that, if we only if we just wait for that, then these problems that are pressing social problems are going to pass us by if you just sit around and wait for. No, for no, no, no. Nobody's suggesting you sit no. around and wait. But it is a scientific question. And we would like to get to the bottom okay. of it. For more debates, talks and interviews. Subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.